The first time I realized my mom was a crack dealer was when I was six. Her and her boyfriend, my dad, asked my brother and I to go into the bedroom while some of their friends came over. This was the tenth night in a row that they had asked us to do this. And since the TV was in the living room, being stuck on a bunk bed with my four-year-old brother got boring pretty quickly. When I came out to beg my mom if my brother and I could watch American Idol, something felt different. My mom didn't look like my mom, and her friends were all in their pajamas or boxer shorts with no shirts. I didn't know what drugs were at the time, but I knew the situation wasn't good. I told my brother that Fox had canceled American Idol for the rest of the year, so he might as well stay in our room and go to bed. He believed me, and to this day, he's still never seen our mom high in person. By the time my mom was arrested for drug trafficking when I was in the sixth grade, I was pretty angry about her career choice and the level of risk she put on our family. In order for me to see her in jail, the court requested that I take counseling classes from a local nonprofit. That's where I met Ronnie, my mentor. Ronnie has taught me so many things over the years, but the strategy I use the most is don't hold anything in. I used to keep everything to myself and not talk to anyone about how I'm feeling or what I'm going through at a particular time. This made me angry and unable to process my emotions about what was going on in my life. Ronnie explained that holding on to long-term problems only slows people down. He was right, which is why I have made lots of friends that I can lean on as supports whenever I need to. In college, I hope to have even more. Every child has a story. You just have to ask. Then they have to write and you have to listen. And eventually, it'll come out perfect because it's true. I'm Josh Arnold, and in this episode of Catch This Podcast, we're telling stories. Direct from the Lamert Park neighborhood of the Crenshaw District in South Central Los Angeles. Not only will we explore student narratives and the manner in which they're expressed, but we'll hear from the teachers and counselors that help our young people discover just who it is they really are and the process by which they share their stories with the colleges and universities they're applying to be a part of. Disclaimer, the three stories we share in this podcast episode are true, all written and read by students, but we've left out names and switched up voices to preserve anonymity. So sit back, relax, and turn the volume up, because we're starting with Jay-Z. The most important thing I got is that everything is connected. Mm -hmm. Every emotion is connected and it comes from, a, from somewhere. And just being aware of it. Being aware of it in everyday life mm -hmm. puts you at such a, you at such an advantage. Mm -hmm. I was just saying, there was a lot of fights in our neighborhood that started with, what you looking at? Are you looking at me? You looking at me? And then you realize, oh, you, oh, you think I see you. Mm -hmm. You're in a space where you're hurting and you think I see you, so you don't want me to look at you. Okay, so let's start there with Jay-Z, a world-renowned storyteller, explaining the power and impact of connections and vulnerability, two essential components of storytelling that are both distinctly difficult for anyone, let alone teenagers, to master. Jay-Z says that knowing how you and your life are connected puts you at an advantage. Let's think about that for a moment. How many of us adults consider our connections on a regular basis? Exactly. Then how do we get kids to do it? Here's Miss T and Miss Fuentes, Catch Prep's guidance and college counselors, talking about the process of student self-discovery. To tell a story, you first have to know you have one. Only then can you connect the dots. I think first the students have to accept their own self-identity and be comfortable and confident with who they are first um, before, any, before they can even tell their story or navigate through their experiences yeah they have to feel comfortable with themselves or else you know it's hard for them to think about it but once you project it it's you know it's like this is my life this is my life whatever it is this is it i know it i've thought about it and i accept it though it might sound like a therapy session which it kind of is this is the beginning of forming a self-narrative you have to be okay with who you are and how you got there. Jay-Z intimated the necessity of being vulnerable. 
He knows that an author can't connect if they aren't honest. A rapper can't move the crowd if they don't say anything real. And a student, especially one growing up in an isolated inner city, can't convince a college admissions officer to stamp their application accepted unless they really know what they're talking about, as in themselves. You need to have thought about why you are the way you are and be able to articulate that journey to the world. Being vulnerable, right? We've all been there, including our very own college counselors. Here's what Miss T and Miss Fuentes say about the first time they realized they have a story and that it matters a lot. I found out I had one um, actually when I started working at Catch. And I found out that my story is very compelling, just like the other kids here. And it's valid and it, it, um, it inspires others um, in ways that I never knew was possible. I didn't really think of myself having a story, but coming to catch and learning to, you know, through Miss Pat and then interacting with the students, I, w I was able to see, like, have connection with them as well. And that I have my own story that I could have, for example, done it in high school and, you know, done it in my UC or personal statements. So we've got the first part, honesty and discovery, or as Jay-Z said, connections and vulnerability. But what's next for putting a student narrative together? Love. That's right, love. Telling the truth is scary. Students need to trust you and know that you will love them no matter what the reality of their circumstances are. It's only once you've demonstrated love, not just regard or concern, but love, that a young person can have the confidence and wherewithal to just step out and share their story and trust whatever happens next. For more on love, we turn to the incomparable poet, author, civil rights activist, and storyteller, Maya Angelou. She talks about how her grandmother helped her not just tell her story, but speak it all. The love between them set her free. Like a parent, a teacher's faith in a child can fill them for the rest of their lives. My grandmother, my father's mother, raised me. She was an amazing woman. She told me, sister, when you get, give. When you learn, teach. And she used to tell me, sister, mama don't know what she's going to do. Mama just going to step out on the word. Just step out on the word of God. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. People call me stupid, dumb, uh, a moron, an idiot, because I didn't speak for six years. I was a mute. And Mama used to tell me when she'd braid my hair, my hair was huge and very curly. My Mama would say, Sister, Mama don't care what these people say, but you must be an idiot, you must be a moron, because you can't talk. Sister, Mama don't care. Mama know when you and the good Lord get ready. You're going to be a teacher. Sister, you're going to teach all over this world. I used to sit there and think, this poor ignorant woman, doesn't she know I will never speak? I've taught at the Bema Theater in Israel, in Tel Aviv. I've taught in Egypt. I've been distinguished visiting professor at the University of Exeter in England. I've taught in Rome and all over the United States. And each time I have another honor, I think of my grandma. Mm. So, I am grateful to be, have been loved and to be loved now and to be able to love because that liberates. Love liberates. It doesn't just hold. That's ego. Love liberates. Grandma was right, and the child version of Maya Angelou was liberated by the love and faith of someone close to her. The next student narrative you're about to hear came about precisely through this same process of faith and love. That is to say, the next story's author has been keenly aware of their story for years now, 
So much so, they've taken lessons from it and used it to fuel important relationships in their life. But they never shared it. And there were apprehensions about using it to apply to college. Would they be judged? Would the audience be able to relate? In the end, the student decided that this is who they are and that the right fit and match for their educational future would be found so long as they stayed true to themselves. Here, take a listen. The craziest part about living on the street for two years is that I didn't realize we were homeless until much, much later. Staying at friends' houses and living in a shelter for a few weeks at a time all felt pretty normal when it was happening. I never missed a day of school throughout us being homeless in fifth and sixth grade. If I was going to be late, I would cry to my mom about how important it is to be punctual, only realizing now that we were sharing bathrooms and taking public transportation and including variables in our school routine that most families didn't have to deal with. School was where I would spend the majority of my day. I ate all three of my meals while on campus and was always the last to be picked up from our after-school program just before 6 p.m. I loved school because it reminded me that I didn't have to be sad all the time. At school, I could be with my friends or sit at my desk and not always have to share things the way I had to at home. I owned things when I was at school. My pencil belonged to me. I sat in the same spot for lunch every day. And there was a routine and rhythm about my school experience that made me feel safe and normal. Things are better now. And me and my mom live in an apartment with her and her boyfriend. I have a bed that's mine, clothes and school supplies that I own, and I feel connected to my life and future in ways that I never felt before. Being homeless taught me that even though bad things can happen to good people, it's important to find a routine that you can rely on to get through a struggle. At the University of California, I know I'll develop a routine to keep me focused, happy, and able to be successful every step of the way. To think that that story was almost never told is scary. Thankfully, there are educators out there spending just as much time building a social-emotional connection with students as they are drilling down on content and overly assessing progress. Which brings us to our third pillar of storytelling at Catch Prep. Remember, first you need to believe you even have a story. Second, you need to love yourself and be loved enough to share it. And third, you need to put your story in perspective. And for that, adults play a particularly important role. Yeah, I, I think if we don't help our students tell these compelling stories, that uh, they will never be heard. And for me, it's just this is just one story. Like. We have 50 students in our senior class, so there's 50 stories there. And it's just amazing how they overcome all of this at such a young age. Perspective. Put another way, somebody needs to tell you as an author that what you've been experiencing is extraordinary. In some cases, it's heroic. But if how you live and what you've been through is commonplace in your community, how are you supposed to know as a teenager how brave you've been by enduring a set of circumstances you thought were normal? That's where perspective comes in, and steps one and two of the storytelling process, vulnerability and love, become crucial to a student being able to share their story in relation to the world they and their audience both inhabit. Miss T explains this well when she recounts a story from a senior who graduated a few years back. There's one senior two years ago who told her story um, about her family living in a studio with her mother, her sister, her grandfather, and three dogs, three huge pit bulls. And the studio was maybe 400 square feet. And she had no idea that this was not normal, that this was, that she's poor, that she's living in poverty. Um, so we helped her realize that you can get out of poverty. This is not, there's, there's other ways out of your lifestyle. Um, and she got into UCLA. She told her story and she got into many schools. What Miss T explains we found is extremely common when working with students to shape a story. In general, young people accept the environment in which they live. 
Check out what first-round NBA draft pick Michael Beasley says about his environment growing up with fellow NBA All-Star Kevin Durant in Prince George County, Maryland. It was only once he made it to the NBA that he realized where he came from. Honestly, it was fun. Yeah, we had a good time like, as kids. Man. Yeah, I tell people all the time, like, man, when you're a kid, you don't know you're in the hood, or yeah. you don't know you're poor, or you don't know, you know, yeah. you just, just accept in your environment when you're a child, and that's when your friends are really your friends wholeheartedly, and nothing is malicious, and it's always, you know, maybe you stole somebody's girlfriend, or they returned yeah. somebody's pen, <laughs> but when you're a kid, it's like, you forget how carefree and, and, and like, well, not forget, you don't even know. Like, yeah. you just. It's typically later as adults that we start to question and perhaps become cynical about our circumstances. The more we know, the more we seem to doubt as human beings, right? What will always be true, though, is that each and every one of us has an important story to tell about where we come from and what we've learned from our upbringing. And at schools like Catch Prep, those stories can actually turn into opportunities, real ones that are life-changing. There's no limit to the kinds of stories we all have. And before we share our last student narrative, catch what founder and executive director, Miss Pat, says about catch stories and their place amongst them all. And you know, sometimes in a black community, you only get to hear the story if it's a ball play. And the ball player sits and he tells his story and then he thanks his mother. So these aren't ball players. They're just your average children going to school, getting good grades. And this gives them an opportunity and a mic to tell their story. Your parents didn't pay tuition this semester. I'm afraid you can't take your final exams. Word for word, this is what was said to me by my principal in June of my sophomore year of high school. I will never forget the feeling of being embarrassed, upset, and offended all at the same time. It's okay, colleges don't look at your sophomore year anyway, my principal said to try and console me. She then led me to an office to meet with the finance person who asked all kinds of questions about money and income I had no idea how to answer. I just wanted to take my finals and get my grades, but because I went to a private school in South Central Los Angeles, and my dad had recently lost his job and asked for an extension on the tuition bill. I was held out a final exam spring of my sophomore year. My grades that semester are a culmination of what I earned up until the last bill my dad paid. My sister and I don't go to that school anymore. We transferred to a public charter school where they care about helping kids get into college as opposed to making money off of poor working class families like mine. My grades are back to what they've always been, mostly A's and a few B's, but most of all, I feel respected and treated fairly as a student here. Looking back, the hardest part about my final exam ordeal wasn't really being held out because my parents never paid the last tuition bill the semester. It was the moment my principal said, colleges don't look at your sophomore year anyway. She was completely wrong, and she said it to me with utter confidence and assuredness. How many other students have been told this myth, or go to a school where the adults don't know or don't care about exactly what it takes to get to college. My sister and I got lucky, but there is much to do to make the schools better in my community. Whoever you are listening to this podcast, whatever you do for a living, and whichever community you do it in, remember the power of story and that everyone you intersect with has one. And if you should ever be so fortunate as to have someone share a story with you that doesn't sound like yours, listen. It'll always come out perfect if it's true. I'm Josh Arnold, and you've been listening to Catch This Podcast, a public service of Catch Prep Charter High School in South Central Los Angeles. As always, we thank our students for sharing with us their amazing stories. And for the record, every narrative you heard in this episode led to a college acceptance. Mm -hmm.